Welcome back, Trad Men listeners. Uh, very interesting episode tonight. Um, and I want to thank you guys for joining us. We have two guests with us today who are going to talk about something called the Catholic Land Movement. And if you don't know what the Catholic Land Movement is, that's okay, because you're going to find out on this episode. <laughs> um, we've got Michael, uh, we've got Mike, and we've got Fred. Um, and these two guys are up in upstate New York. They're going to talk with, with us uh, tonight and inform us on a very, I think, interesting and really spiritually beneficial aspect of uh, a way that people are living the faith. And um, I think a lot of listeners will really get a lot out of this episode. It's it should be a lot of fun. Uh, but as, as always, uh, when we begin, we invoke the divine blessing. And today, being Pentecost, happy birthday to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We want Amen. to invoke the Holy yeah. Ghost to bestow his wisdom upon us so that we can have uh, an edifying discussion and then, of course, we were all shocked and horrified at the, uh, the, the the news coming out of Nigeria. So we're going to say three Hail Marys for the repose of the soul of the Christians that were martyred in Nigeria and for the triumph of the sacred heart of Jesus in the entire world. Uh, so please join us along. In nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Vini Sancti Spiritus, Reple Tura, Corda Fidelium, et Tui Amoris in Eis Ignim Accende. Imite spiritum tuum et creabuntur. Et renovabis facem tere. Oremus. Deus qui corda fidelium sancti spiritus illustrationi docuisti. Da nobis in iodem spiritu recta sapere. Et de eos semper consolazione gadere. Per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei. Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy, have on, mercy us. on us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us, what is the... Now, I'm going to start with, I'm gonna start with Mike, and then I'm going to move over to Fred. Okay. When, when I say the Catholic land movement, what is that exactly? Uh, that's a great question. I, well, we've, had, <laughs> we've had a series of Zooms with, a group, with several different groups of people trying to define exactly exactly <laughs> that. Um, and uh, It's like trying to define, like, what is what is the traditionalist Catholic movement? It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Big tent, right? So, yep. so I'll, I'll speak for me and what I'm taking to it. So when I speak about the Catholic move, land movement, I'm speaking – pretty specific about the the movement of english distributists like in the in the earlier part of of the of the century um who saw small-scale homesteading as a means to kind of live um uh pope uh, uh pope leo the 13th uh encyclical um uh, you know about it was like a a, a means through which to uh, restore property and restore relationship to first things. And with that, the grace that God has left us in the soil. And so um, it was a very specific movement that emerged in England. And then it kind of started to spread out all over the world. And I really see the work that we're trying to do as a restoration of, of that work by Father Vincent McNabb, by, you know, uh, bigger names like Chesterton and Belloc. Um, that for, for me, the, that is what I'm, what drew me to the Catholic land movement. There's been people since then, Father Fay and other people who are like, you know, this, uh, a looser and broader sense or, uh, of, um, of Catholic agrarianism that, that incorporated like more like pre and post-war critiques on liberalism. And, and I think that's all, you know, it kind of grows, the distributists grow in one direction, the Catholic agrarianism grows in another direction and it becomes like multifaceted. And so, for me, it's really, really the pure uh, call that Father Vincent McNabb put out in, in the, you know, it's like the late teens and 20s, I think. It was kind of like the 20s pre-war, um, this call to back to the land. I think it's the first time I really like back to the land. And this, it's, it's, it's a reactionary movement um, that is reacting against ri the, the rising tide of industrialism. 
um, kind of like many other social movements were, were reacting to that. Um, and it was an answer that wasn't communism. It was an answer that was like grounded in faith. Um, it was grounded in an idea of like relationship to the soil and family and Catholic faith. And so I really see our current times calling uh, that that calling that disposition of back to the land is rising in people again. And so as a Catholic, I look to history and say, where has this happened before? You know, the rising global technocracy is, is centralizing power and trying to drive people away from primary things people are being called back to the landscape. And so my, my impulse as a Catholic is like, where has this happened before? Let's try and understand it. And in that, I find the movement of Father Vincent McNabb in the Catholic land movement and really want to join in fellowship with other Catholics, explain to them what it was, explain to them, you know, what was going on there, and then ourselves pick up that work again. So for me, that's what I mean when I talk about the Catholic land movement. It's li quite literally picking back up the work of Father Vincent McNabb and the English distributists before they kind of got lost in the, in, in the war and then the post-war kind of stuff that went on um, and, and take it back to those original tenets of back to the land, first things, the glorification of God through a simple life uh, with closeness to the grace that he has left us. So, um, so there you go. And, right. in, and in today's world, you know, th this idea uh, that you're describing seems very re uh, revolutionary, right? It's, it, it's going against, especially in the Western world and the mm -hmm. first world countries, it, it's going <laughs> against what everybody tells you you should, you should be doing. And it's kind of crazy when you think about it because not too long ago in the past that was how people lived that was that was normal but today to say you want to go back to the land they try to they try to dismiss you you know with with, with many different ways but i think i think once you actually look into the movement and and uh you know re read father mcnab and and chesterton and others like that you you really come to grips with this isn't this isn't some some idea that's just loony left field type stuff. It's something that, that is actually very important. And hopefully we'll get into later about how <laughs> it will help your spiritual life in so many ways. Cause ultimately that's our goal, right? It's not, uh, it's not to be successful in this world. It's to be successful in the afterlife. Right. So um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to getting in more to the spiritual aspect of it as well. Fred, when, when, when I say the Catholic land movement to you, Tell us what that means from your perspective. Well, my, I always say this, and Mike always um, calls me out on it, but Mike is the expert on this. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the new guy on the block, the Catholic land movement. Um, actually, it was Mike and his Twitter account that got me into the Catholic land movement. I was following him for a while. I was following his post and his wife's post. And uh, long story short, he invited me up to see his farm, which I I was happy to uh, to go, go up there. And it was, I, know, I think, last June we were up there, and I just fell in love with the lifestyle, the farm. And I uh, I was looking for real estate up here, and I found uh, my little farm here, about six miles away from Mike. So. If someone told me last year, this time, that I would be up here, I wouldn't believe it. But the, re the other reason I came up here is for spiritual spiritual reasons. The last few years, I was, you know, obviously everyone sees what's going on in the world and, and where the world is headed. And the last, well, year and a half or whatever, it's gotten so far worse, as we all know. And I had built uh, my own chapel. I was living in, in urban New Jersey. I built my own chapel in my basement. And I, was, I had an actual international uh, group that were getting ready to um, be prepared for any eventuality, that we would continue our Catholic faith, um, however, wherever it, it took us. And we were prepared for any eventuality. We got all the supplies, everything we needed. Um, and, but last year, I felt that the Lord was saying he wanted me to come up here. He wanted me to either found or find a traditional Catholic community that was centered around the Eucharist. And it was very specific. That, that was, it was very pointed. That, that's the exact phrase that 
came in, you know, came into my mind. And lo and behold, long story short, here we are. <clears throat> uh, by the grace of God, we have a traditional Catholic community. Uh, we have the Latin Mass, and our community is growing. Uh, not in, as far as the church goes, we're getting more more people at church. We are getting more people to move up to our area. I have some people moving, you know, not just a half a mile behind me here. They bought 30 acres. They're moving in, I think, next week. There's another uh, family in our parish that just moved in, what was that, Monday, Mike? Or I think so, yeah. 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 They just moved into their farm, 90 acres on their farm, and we're all getting closer and closer. That's what, you know, the community is. Uh, there's a lot of Amish around here, so we could call us the Catholic Amish. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, that was it. And today we had a wonderful mass out in the um, Orsville Shrine, the, where the Jesuit martyrs were, Saint Kateri. We had a solemn high mass there with with our our community. And plus, being where it is, there's even more people coming, and more people are finding out about the traditional Latin mass. Um, I mean, God. today today was amazing. I, I wasn't it, Mike, with the deacon, the subdeacon. Yeah, it was. It was. It was, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. So anyway, that's what led me up here. And <clears throat> again, I saw what was happening in the city, and this is like an oasis. You know, I feel somewhat <laughs> uh, guilty about because I'm in a safe place. I have. I have. A spring, I have running water, I have my own heat, I have food, I'm prepared, you know. But I think that's what the Lord is calling all of us to do. Maybe not, you know, find a farm and live on it, but to be prepared for what's coming. Because uh, as we see it, the recent events, uh, recent events in the Vatican, different uh, appointments and things like that, uh, it's going to get harder and harder for traditional Catholics to uh, have mass. Um, so this, um, again, we're all prepared for whatever may happen, and we have our community. So that's and that's why amazing, I'm here. That's my focus. Isn't it amazing how a sim how simplicity brings happiness? And you would and and what the world tells us is, if you want to be happy, you got to have the most money, you got to have the most chicks, you got to have the yeah. you got to drive the nicest cars, you got to be yeah. the coolest guy, you got to have the best, you have to have the most prestigious job, and you have to, and then you know, you, you spend your life chasing all these baubles. Exactly. You're chasing your tail. That's what and, it is. And then you come out and you, and, and I listen to Fred, I've got my heat, I've got yeah. my running water <laughs> and how happy you become in just the simple Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Life. Um, I, I thought I was thinking about the Catholic man movement today at mass. And I was thinking about the, the show and how we would talk about this. And I thought we could really start the Catholic land movement in Genesis. God creates, uh, he creates a hierarchy of creation over seven days, and then he creates us in his image and likeness, not to just, you know, just, just for no specific reason. He's got something he wants us to do, and what does he give us to do? He gives us a garden. Mm -hmm. And not, not just to live in the garden, to not just to live the lap of luxury in this garden, but to tend the garden. Sorry. And we can't just now here's the thing about that, that I thought was interesting about this is God says you can't just do any darn thing you want to in this garden. Now, there, you know, you you're you're below me in the hierarchy of creation. So here's the things that I want you to do. And here's a list of things I would like you not to do. And I, I thought that was really beautiful. But when you when we look at how we how we consume food, how we make uh, our resources, how we make, how, how we, where our clothes come from. I think, you know, uh, um, I had a discussion once when I was in school with somebody, I, I was going hunting and they were just horrified by that. And I said, Hey, <laughs> if you see the way I kill my dinner versus the way McDonald's kills your dinner on ethical grounds, I win hands oh, down. I've actually, I've actually got a quick story on that because, you know, talked about it before on this show about how, uh, we look at our ancestors for some reason today with contempt, like we're so much better, so much smarter, but we've lost all those skills of procuring our own food, of hunting, of making clothes, right? Absolutely. So you, you, you talk about McDonald's. 
when I, this company I used to work for used to deliver cryogenic gases to different companies, you know, from food processing to welders, to hospitals, so on and so forth. One of the drivers went to this, this company where they slaughtered, um, mm. all the cows for McDonald's for the McDonald's meat. And he said, once he went to that place, he never mm. ate another McDonald's mm. hamburger. Cause he's like, you should have seen the cows they were bringing into that joint. He goes, I will never eat another one again. And it, and it's scary because you don't know, like I, I'm guilty of it right now as well. We, we buy food at the grocery store. We do all that, but we really don't know what kind of condition, how it was killed and so on and so forth. But, but these guys right here, you know, and, and, and other people in, in the, in the land movement or homesteaders or whatever, they have a more sense of the work that it takes to, to provide your own food, which in turn is going to give you more gratitude because it's a lot more difficult and time can, you know, time consuming than just running up to the store. So, mm -hmm. so I, I think it also lends to the idea that I'm going to be more grateful because I know the work that it took to get this food on the table. Um, well, Mike, Mike could talk about that. Mike has a good story about the, the cycle of life uh, on the land. Right, Mike, tell us about that. <laughs> Well, I just want to touch on the two things that both of you, uh, Jason and Mark, just just brought up, which I think speaks to the core of of, of the, the the Catholic land movement and writings of Father Vincent McNabb, which were and, and Chesterton, um, which really find their genesis in the writings of Leo the Thirteenth, in which he speaks to us about God's grace in giving us the abundance of of the earth, and that if we are, he wouldn't. He would not put us here and not give us the means to take care of ourselves. He, he would put us here and he gives us dominion over the earth in order to steward creation in a way that is, is you know, beautifies creation and sings his glory, which is also taking care of our fellow man and taking care of our families. And so he gives us the means in the earth to do that. And that's what dominion's about. It's about proper stewardship of the gifts that God has given us. And again, tending, tending the garden, the, uh, Father Vincent McNabb writes beautifully about it by calling them first things. And Mark, you identified them like, you know, you get back to those simple things. Your, where does your food come from? Where does your water come from? Where does your heat come from? You begin to appreciate those things. And it's very, very important that like modernity and the, the, the modern republics believe that like through our participation in economies that we can get a wage. And then with that wage, we can procure primary things, first things. But proximally, we're not, we have no relationship to them, right? So mm -hmm. poverty is is alleviated by by a wage that's given from the mediation of some other entity, whether it's a government or a corporation that you work for or whatever, and you get paid enough money to then go out and buy those primary things. But as we're seeing now is that there's there's a hollow promise in that. There's inflation, there's supply chains, there's all these things that can quickly evaporate the ability for that mediating wage procure you your primary things the grocery store is empty it doesn't you could have a million bucks if the grocery store is empty the grocery store is empty yeah. or maybe that burger is going to cost a million bucks right if your money's inflated to a butt if the cow is eating on your own field and your proximity to that primary thing to, to that to that food source is is real and tangible without that mediation well then you have the means to lift both yourself up out of poverty and then lift your brothers and sisters out of poverty and so the real alleviation of poverty on this earth is proximity to first things and so that's a real core of what the land movement was about and and there is a joy in like knowing that like my my someone asked me like oh how, how do you like your eggs I have like a picture of my kids on the internet with like a basket full of eggs. And somebody's like, how do you like your eggs? Meaning like, you know, do I like omelets or scrambled or whatever? I'm like, I like them out of my coop, you know? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you yeah. go. There, there's the joy, you know? Um, and so, uh, and so that proximity to first things necessitates property. Um, so, so it's like this guarantee by, by, by giving a man property and, and, and that, that property is kind of this right. Um, that, that, that we have as individuals to own things, to be the stewards of things, right? To take dominion over a piece of land that, that that's, that's fundamental to our Catholicism. Um, and so with that, um, you know, that's why the era of communism is so egregious because it, it attempts to disconnect it and mediate it all through a, a, 
uh, some type of secular agency. But no, no, our relationship to the soil and our relationship to the land is actually given to us by the grace of God. And nothing should mediate us from, you know, or stand in between us and our relationship to the soil. So, um, and so the, the second part uh, was you could give a man like a whole, and this speaks to what you were saying, Jason, that we've, that we've drifted away from traditions um, and that we don't even know where our food comes. We don't even, aren't even aware of where the stuff we're getting. And, and really you could give, right. I, you could probably give me uh, or all of us like a, a full hardwood forest, but we wouldn't necessarily know how to turn it into timber frames and build a house. Mm. Right. So God can give us these things, but it's only through transmitted tradition that we continue the, 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 the practical means to understand how to procure primary things, first things for ourselves, food, clothing, shelter, you know, uh, uh, all these things, you know, uh, water. You need someone to show you. So you need this practical line of tradition that's unbroken. I tried to do draft agriculture with horses and it was largely a disaster because I just like bought a horse. <laughs> in my attic, in my attic, you know, I like threw some stuff on. It was like we're gonna. Pop it. <laughs> well, it was a disaster. You know, the horse tried to kick me. I couldn't get it straight. I don't know what about horses. You know, I had like dogs and sheep. You know, a couple goats. Sure. So, so, um, so I had had no. I had this great poverty that I had to overcome. So, so the alleviation of poverty comes from two things: one, from property, from the access to first things, and two, from the unbroken line of tradition. And that is the core, you know, well, part of this is we want to have a discussion about distributism. That's the core of distributism, keeping those mm. two things alive, keeping well distributed property is good for society, keeping communities close to the procurement of first things and keeping on broken line of tradition. Right. Not serving economies, but saying, like, imagine if every single man knew how to timber frame. There was a time mm. when, like, that was the case. And mm. most men could throw out the barn. That's why we're still living in the barns. Yeah, that's my house, you know, <laughs> but it's why we're still living in those structures to this day. You know, um, we're still living in like kind of the, the, the runes and on the shoulders of great men before us. Um, not many people want to build a house anymore, you know, even with True. all the modern convenience. And so, and so that's, so the, those are the two strands of what the land movement is doing is one is trying to like get property into the hands of people and two, trying to give people the means to work that property to procure primary things. So, you know, so, so keeping traditions, agrarian, craft, art, traditions alive. Um, you know, and I know we want to re leave room for a theological discussion, so I can go there too. But I think you guys just pointed out really quick, um, just to point out that you guys are hitting on like, you both hit on like the core tenets of distributism and, and land movement stuff that I like to talk to people about. But Mark, I know you opened with a question and I just went off in a <laughs> No, that's exactly what I wanted you to that's exactly what I wanted you to talk about. And what I what I was really and my yeah. wife is into the Catholic land movement and I was talking with her a little bit about this. Now she's not, you know, the 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 Catholic land movement, you know, academic expert or whatever, but I was talking with her about it. I said, What's it mean to you? And she said, Really? Because we live in Houston, Texas, not exactly in the middle of the country. It's like the fourth largest city in the country, right? Uh, we're city folks for sure but we have our garden, we have our backyard chickens. And she was telling me that really in her mind, the Catholic land movement, if you lived in a high rise in midtown Manhattan, you could be a part of the Catholic land movement. It's really about at its core essence, you are resubordinating yourself to your proper place in the hierarchy of creation. And you are understanding that this, this earth that God created for us to dwell in it, it, yes, he gave it for us to tend, but it is not ours to do with any darn way we please with. We cannot just do anything we want. We don't, we are, we have dominion over the earth. We don't have sovereignty over the earth. God has sovereignty over the earth. Oh, yes. And I, I thought that was so beautiful. And I thought this is really something that anybody can be a part of. You don't have to sell your home and move out and start a farm. Oh, yeah. You can live in a high rise in midtown Manhattan and in your own way, according to the way that you can do it, you can live a part of this movement. There's, so I thought that was really nice. There's a lot of small scale homesteaders like in the cities because, you know, you can even grow like an orchard in your backyard based on how you, how you plant the trees and close yeah. proximity proximity and how they overgrow so yeah i mean you're right i mean it doesn't have to be on a grand scale with 30 acres and stuff like that you can work with what you have too yeah 
So I think uh, that, that that is called a movement, right? So it's not it's not a place. It's not the, the Catholic land village. It's, <laughs> right. it's, 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 a, it's a movement. It's, right. it's, it's the idea that we're moving towards a closeness. I would say that if we were to con continue to pursue that line, you would find yourself wanting no. to have a small piece of land to tend. You know, if you were to center that, you'd say, well, in order to mix crops and, and raise sheep and, you know, in order to process meat, I'm going to need, you know, 15 acres, depending on where you are, you know, and maybe yeah. you can plug into a matrix where you don't, you don't need quite that. You know, everyone's vocational calling and virtue is very, very different, right? So we are, we're all called to different places. And so there's places for cities too. Um, right now, right, our cities are wholly separate from the uh, rural landscape. Yeah. Rather than they, they're tied into global chains of dependency, you know? So really the restoration of the rural has a lot to do with the restoration of the polis, which is, which is linking that city again and the resources in that city to the landscape you know, um, and to the rural landscape around it, uh, immediately around it, I mean, right. and the idea, the restoration of the idea of a polis. And so, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is back, back to uh, one point, Jason, I think you use the word, this is kind of like a revolutionary idea. I think it shocks people to think like yeah. that. I wince as a traditionalist, I wince at the word revolution. But I, <laughs> that, Fair I, point. I would say that it is swimming in the opposite direction <laughs> of where the global technology is <laughs> obviously trying to take us, right? It's, yeah. It swims in, 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 in the other way. We're saying, no, we want to go backwards. So I always identify it as a reactionary movement, you know? Yeah, yeah, fair I'm enough, yeah. Progressive. I'm like, no, I'm regressing. <laughs> there you go, yeah. You know? I, I don't want to progress anymore. I see where that's going, and I'm, I don't, I'm not interested, you know? And so... Yeah. And so, I've got a question for Fred. Um, Fred, you so you you're kind of new at the at the at the farming aspect of it, at this, or you've been I, at it for about a year. I want you, if you could, contrast for us what it was like to eat your dinner when you lived in the city versus how you look at eating your dinner now. Well, uh, as you mentioned earlier, we have more appreciation for our food. We we see what goes into you know what goes into. Well, I mean, I did have, we did have our garden back in Jersey, you know, and we, we knew that that was, that was wonderful to, you know, plant the seeds and to um, eat, eat the, the product of that. But now we're also moving into canning. <clears throat> so right now, well, I have crushed, I have a few acres across the street from me where I have my chickens and I'm babysitting some goats for someone. But we have our garden that we started. Uh, I also built a greenhouse for, for my wife to get things started. Um, and my wife is um, getting into canning. So we're going to be canning as much of our uh, produce as possible. Again, that's, uh, again, I keep looking at the long range um, scenario and how <clears throat> people are going to survive in the coming times. Uh, you talk about, you know, the city and if, if things go down, it's going to go down really quick and it's going to get really ugly. Um, I hate to be a Debbie down in here, but think negatively, but that's, again, that's another reason we're up here is to kind of uh, save ourselves from that scenario. And also, we, like I said, I, well, I've been working on my house here for a since September for the last few months, uh, renovating it. And I plan to have a lot of rooms for my kids if they ever need it or other people uh, if, if things, you know, go south. Um, and so that's that's my main focus with, with all this. We there's are a, trying to... Uh, I don't you know, know if you guys listen to country and Western music, but there's a great song by Hank Williams Jr. called Country Folks Can Survive. You ever heard that song? <laughs> no. I'll listen and, to it later, though. <laughs> well, it it just goes, you know, it's a it's uh, when when you when you're dependent on getting out there, getting up every morning early, and going out and working every day for your food, um, you, you don't have the luxury of not knowing how to survive. Exactly. You have to, yeah, right. you know, and so and so that's going to be something that's going to be a priority. And I remember when I when the first time I went hunting as a as a young younger man, much younger man, almost a not quite a child, obviously, but to the at the appropriate age. Um, and 
I ate my first kill. It was a duck. And I just remember thinking, this duck gave its life right. so that I can have sustenance. And right. I need to be appreciative of that. Right. And thank God for, and, and I, re, and I remember that was the, the first time I remember saying grace over a meal, mm. really understanding why it was we say grace over a meal mm. at, at first, I just, I guess kind of thought, well, it's a thing we do to show God that, you know, we're obeying the rules kind of a thing. And that it's, it's to teach us that, you know, think about how long does it make it take to make a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? You could say three minutes, except not true. It takes a season for that wheat to grow. And then somebody's got to go out and get that wheat. Somebody's got to pick those peanuts. Somebody's got to roast those peanuts. Yeah. By the time all that stuff gets to you, it may take you five minutes, right. but it doesn't take five minutes to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It takes a lot of hard work from That's a right. lot of people. And that really put that sort of in perspective for me. And I was wondering if, if, if that's been your experience moving out to the country where you really gain this new perspective on where, where you are in your place in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I, oh. I did no, no, go ahead, Fred. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, no. I was just going to ask, cause I, I, either one of you can answer or both of you, if you, if you choose to, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the family and, and the work that that you guys do on, on your land or others within the Catholic land movement specifically. But community plays a vital role in this as well. Correct. Mm -hmm. Would that be a, a fair assessment? Because you would uh, need a community around you to say, help put up a barn or if you're short, maybe one one. Uh, I don't know, for lack of better terms, product, you know, you can barter and stuff like that. Can, can you speak to the community importance as well? Oh, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, I have some people that are going to be moving to 30 acres, you know, just behind me. But I'm in the process of, of building them a tiny house at the moment since they have no structures on the land to speak of. So, yeah, we all do that. I mean, I have those skills. I have, you know, a lot of uh, construction skills. Mike has a lot of farming skills. Mike has been, Mike and his wife have bent over backwards to help us out here. They gave us a, a wood stove. In fact, they, Mike just gave me more plants today to, to play in my garden, you know? So, yeah, we all do that. And another woman has taught my wife and, and Mike's wife about canning. Uh, other people, well, have uh, given us food and things like that. And then people go in and they buy half a cow and this and that. And we all barter, you know? And that's, you know, and Mike, Mike can speak to, you know, for his own self, but Mike makes apple cider and I've helped him. And it's a fascinating process. And uh, it's passing on that tradition he was talking about. Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. But, but yeah. Mike uses that to barter too, you know? So we all, and, and like I said, this community is, I, I'm only up here since September and <clears throat> it, it was started before that, but it's really growing it's with Mike's addition and his family and other people coming in. This community that we have is growing. And there's more and more skills and there's more and more people to help each other out. Um, we went to, to this other people's farm the other day when they, they just moved in on Monday. And we helped them move in and things like that. So it's it's a community in the truest sense of the word. Yeah. What and 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 what role does the church play? I mean, I think church is obviously at the center of this community effort. Um, Mike, speak a little bit about the, the role of, because we've, we've sort of laid out the base of the, the sort of philosophical aspect of the Catholic land movement. And I'd like to delve a little bit more into the theological aspect because it's such an important, uh, part of this story. Yep. Um, yeah, we have mostly, right. We've spoken about Catholic social teaching right now and its relationship. Um, and a lot of what I pull is, is Leo the 13th and other kind of, you know, sat Catholic social teaching stuff. But I was just, I, I thought it was a, it was a good segue to talk about um, the theological thing. And some, when I do interviews like this, a lot of times I like to just tell a little bit about my story, which was that I was a cradle Catholic and I was raised in the faith, but I strayed from it like many do all throughout my twenties and, and, and really into like my mid thirties. Um, so, so, okay, so it's a redundant story. So many of us do this. Um, oh yeah. And, uh, and it was through my process and homesteading, much like your story with the duck. Um, 
it was through my process of becoming close to to the landscape that slowly my faith was brought back to me you know and like i would garden all day and feel the need to like have chant or pray and so i remember my grandma's ave right and so i would so i would so i would chant you know hail mary's while i would garden and fiddle about the garden but i wasn't going back to be catholic it's just like the prayer i knew and it felt right to pray while i weeded a bed you know and and then, you know, as it develops more, I get time to read and I'm reading about agriculture. Oh, this guy's Catholic. That guy's Catholic. Oh, this guy's talk. You start to witness when you work with the soil, this kind of like deep mystery in things, right? All things kind of arising and relinquishing in mystery, right? No matter how much science tries, they still can't understand soil chemistry, really. You know, they can't understand the biology of soil or the way a tree really works. So you get the sense of, of, of God, you know, um, and then I'm grafting apple trees and watching the grass grow and watching the grass like flow into the, the animals and then through the animals, you know, flow back into the soil through manure and then back up out of the plants. And then you kind of get this whole like this vast uh, energy cycle that's moving through all things. And it's it's so once you once you really start to see it. Uh, and really pay attention to it and the growth of trees and the growth of livestock. It's like, wow, this is a really powerful force that's moving through everything, you know, the Holy Spirit. And then, and then, and then you, you, you in the third, the third uh, part of it, and this comes to the church. Um, at one point I was sitting and, and just kind of like witnessing, uh, I would do these things where I would just like sit and watch nature around me, just listen. So to really listen to the landscape. And at one point I was looking at, a, a, at an oak tree for an extended period of time and said, what does that tree feel like? If I was that tree, how would I feel? And I realized that this tree was like an enormous, like two thirds of it were dead, you know, <laughs> and just bugs and birds and squirrels were just gnawing at it alive. But from that, this wellspring of life was emerging, right? All these animals were getting life and, you know, my sheep were eating under this big oak tree and right boom, Christ hit me. And so I, so like I get the Trinity and I'm like, oh, right. I'm, I've been praying, you know, Hail Mary's while gardening for the past three years. And I clearly see a Trinity and divinity. I'm Catholic. All of this stuff is, you know, oh. is real. And so it brought me back to the faith, right? So, so through, just like with your duck, uh, compelled you to pray. And in that you felt the presence of real grace and real faith. And it's the duck, right? So, mm. I had this witness like within the entirety of the landscape around me and in my work in communion with it, I felt the, the, this very profound presence of God. And, and as Catholics, what's at the center of our faith is back to what Fred was saying is the Eucharist and what is the Eucharistic sacrament, but not communion. Right. So there's instruction there. There's instruction that for, for me, there was an instruction there that, the Eucharist is at the center of all things and that us communing with this world is part of what our job is to do here. And that's what Christ wow. instructs us to do. And so, so on a theological so and, you know, communion on a theological level has everything to do with farming. It's not just communion. It isn't just the sustenance of my body. Although if you're eating exactly from your landscape, your body is cycling in the landscape just as much as everything else. Right. Hmm. But it's also my work. It's my labor. It's my ideas. It's the things I'm seeing and thinking about. All of my whole existence is communed with place here. And with that is a powerful <laughs> centering. And then I put the Eucharist at the center of that and Christ's instruction about what his sacrifice and communion is. And boom, I get this theological explosion of faith um, and grace that's poured into my life and brought people like Fred and my presence on this show and to spread or that message message to other people like Christ is waiting for us in that landscape for us to commune and to be really, really present with the grace that God offers. And it's something that's offered to every single one of us, right? The answer is like right there and like the grass around us, we like trample it every day <laughs> but there. There's enough for all of us to eat and survive and live. And all this misery and horror is our own arrogance, folly and pride, you know? Um, it's it's all it could be such a beautiful world <laughs> and uh, well so there you go that's i hope that's not too theological but no uh, and i i no, thought he I, needs to mike you might need to write a philosophy or theology book based on that <laughs> that was that was i keep telling him he has to write this stuff down <laughs> you guys wait, i'm just gonna keep on doing podcasts <laughs> <laughs> well i i, I know that the, grab it. the catechism when it when the catechism talks about sin the catechism specifically, and it's it's very interesting 
that it mentions our relationship to the earth and what sin does to that. Um, and, and, and Catechism of the Catholic Church, 389 through 400, it's, a, it's sort of a short paragraph. I'll just read it really quick. In that sin, man preferred himself to God, and, that, and by that very act scorned him. He chose himself over and against God, against the requirements of his creaturely status, and therefore against his own good. Created in a state of holiness, man was destined to be fully divinized by God in glory. Seduced by the devil, he wanted to be like God, but without God, before God, and not in accordance with God. Scripture portrays the tragic consequences of this first act of disobedience. Adam and Eve immediately lose the grace of original holiness. They become afraid of the God whom they have conceived in a distorted image, that of jealous of his prerogatives. The harmony in which they found themselves, thanks to original justice, is now destroyed. The control of the soul's spiritual faculties over the body is shattered. The union of man and woman becomes subject to tensions. Their relations henceforth marked by lust and, and domination. Harmony with creation is broken. Visible creation has become alien and hostile to man. Because of man, creation is now subject to its bondage to decay. Uh, finally, the consequence explicitly foretold for this disobedience will come true. Man will return to the ground for out of which he was taken. Death makes its entrance into human history. So the catechism lays out there's a specific consequence to sin, and it is our alienation from the, from the garden that God gave us. And so when you look at it like that, the land movement is like, if we're going to, if we're going to respond to the grace, to the actual grace that God is giving, there's an, there's an element of that of where we need to reharmonize ourselves to creation. And that comes back to re resubordinating yourself to your proper place in the hierarchy of creation and understanding that you have a job here in this garden. And it's to tend this garden. You can't do any darn thing you want to in this. There, here's a list of things you can't that you can do lawfully, but there's a list of things you can't do. And these animals and and uh, these these trees and things that grow that God has given us, um, we have to treat with respect, mm -hmm. and we have to treat not because we're not because we're worshiping the creation itself. And that's, and I, I think we should probably talk about that. There's a difference between this and environmentalism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and maybe, maybe uh, Mike and Fred can speak a little bit more on what the difference between the modern environmental movement as it calls itself and, and what we're talking about here. Well, just to go back to what you said earlier, I, act, I was actually thinking about this today, about Genesis and the garden. And like you, again, like you said earlier, we're here to get to heaven, okay? Our life, our life on this earth is, is our effort to get to heaven. It's a spiritual battle. Um, evil entered the Garden of Eden, and evil affects us to this very day. We saw what happened to Nigeria today. We see what happens to people all around us when they're affected by evil. And and what what the Catholic land movement is to me is is a further way for me to to get to heaven. Um, we're centered around the Eucharist. Um, we're trying to live as the early Christians did, the first communities. Um, Christ is the center, and and our and our battle here is not against man, not against nation and nation. It's against evil, and we need to again. That's the main point with my this whole Catholic community is for us to all get to heaven, and for us as as fathers and husbands to get the ones that we are responsible for to heaven also. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's my, my take on the whole thing. It, it's it's a spiritual battle. We could talk about this thing, that thing, and the other thing, but the bottom line is eternity. You know, what we do here, you know, I mean, it's just a grain of sand compared to all eternity. Good point. You know, I uh, unless unless Mike had something to jump in on that, I actually. Okay, if I can say one thing, Jason, is that okay? This yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, Please. yeah. go, go ahead. One of the things that the Catholic faith has given me is the idea that I'm, by being a Catholic, I'm part of a very, very long dialogue with other 
men, saints, and women who have wrestled with these questions, Mark, that you're like bringing up. Um, and really, you can go all the way back to the church doctors and go right to Augustine and, and see what, what you know, the, the pursuit of seeking God, you know, in creation um, is, you know, and, and what the error there is, because um, he speaks about it quite, I was just kind of trying to look for the quote exactly, because there's, I forget it, I'm gonna, I, I hate getting the words wrong, you know, when you're like quoting a church. Doctor. Oh, I know, I know. You're going to nail it very, very precisely. We, we misquote the church doctors on this show about 30 times every episode. Please look past our deficiencies, oh Lord, sure, thank you. Sure enough. <laughs> well, one of the beautiful things about being Catholic is that we get the repository of tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, the same way that I don't know how to build a house, all the complicated joints, right? All the complicated ins and outs of, of philosophy. If I just go willy nilly and into it, boy, am I going to lead myself astray and go off? And I myself did that for years, you know, just I was seeing this beauty in creation and I was like, I was off. I was still like vague deism, you know, it wasn't grounded in, in, in Catholic tradition. And so, um, and so, so Augustine specifically speaks of like, it's not, you know, it's not, God is not, you know, uh, here in this world like that, you know, he's outside of time and outside of this world, um, but then comes through this world and all of creation sings to the glory of God through natural order, right? So mm -hmm. I think I had a tweet just a little bit ago that like natural order uh, sings to the, to, the, uh, to the glory of celestial hierarchy. Back, back to what you're saying, Mark, is the more that we harmonize with our, with our ordered place, in creation, the more that we sing in harmony in our actions and our prayers and our thoughts and our minds, the more we align ourselves with the glorification and ultimately the will of God, right? And that's what so many of the saints have perfected, right? They've, they've perfected harmonizing their life with the will of God with the one chance they had. And that's what defeats what, to what Fred's saying. That's what defeats the ancient enemy, you know? Um, and so much the this the the the, the problem of uh, of us getting kicked out of the garden and it being pride and arrogance that took us from the garden is is the same problem that modernity has in mm -hmm. in its mistreatment of of the earth and and the mm -hmm. land it's this arrogance that our governments our secular powers our technologies all of these things that our agency that if we give ourselves power and agency it increasing increasing powers and agencies, then we can solve our problems. No, this next technology, no, this next political system, no, this. And, and the, the, what Christ instructs is that, is that we've, we, we vanquish the ancient enemy in this world. We win through humility, mm. right? Right. Christ could have wiped out Rome. He could have destroyed the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Wasn't he goes up and he dies on a cross, you know? And so what a, what a powerful lesson. And so, and so for us, that humility to our place in, in, in natural order and to uh, our role as stewards and dominion of creation and, and going to that through humility. People often ask me, I just had someone ask me like, so I, they saw me siphon hay by hand and they're like, so is it wrong to use a tractor? You know, am I, am I, am I evil if I use a tractor? <laughs> And my answer isn't, isn't, isn't like yes or no. My, my, my answer is that like, it's enough to, to do it by hand, right? It's, 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 I, there's, there's enough there. If we were to all do that together, there would be enough in the soil. I only scythe for like an hour or two, you know, and then I raked it for maybe like another two hours. If I did that with like five other men, you know, over the course of two or three weekends, I could feed an entire sheep flock. And we could do it at each of our farms, you know, throughout the days. And there would be enough. We wouldn't need all the machines and everything, you know, and all this, you know. If we continue to believe in arrogance and pride that we have the solution to our problems through technology, we will destroy ourselves. We will destroy the gifts that God have, gives, have, have given us and we will destroy this earth. And so the Catholic land movement for me or, or returning to the soil for me is actually willfully taking on humility. No, it's not faster. No, it's not easier. Yes, it's harder. I'm being penitent for for the mistakes that uh, and 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 for the, the the brokenness of my human condition, and and in that I hope to triumph over this world and get home. Um, and so, you know, that's it's humility. You know, I'm I'm willfully being uh, humble by picking up a scythe instead of hopping on a tractor. You know, not to say that the tractor is not evil, but it's it's that's the tool. You know. That's the tool that, that I don't know. I hope I'm making sense. I'm rambling. No, no it does. No, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, 
I did want to touch on uh, – I, I know you've mentioned Pope Leo the Thirteenth, his encyclical, uh, Rerum Novarum, and we've actually done an episode on that previously. However, I will say – I can't speak for Mark, but since I've come across you two guys and read more about the – the back to land and then uh, read Father McNabb's book and, and whatnot. It's really opened up that, that document even way more than, than, than I understood it a few months ago when we did it. I did have two questions and you, you kind of already answered one of them earlier, Mike, when you, uh, but you know, he, in the document, he speaks about the ills of socialism and the evils of it, but he also talks about the, the evils of unfettered capitalism, right? Like not paying people their fair wages, mm -hmm. restricting people from their ability to own property. Um, <clears throat> my first question was that you answered is, is I feel like that people could easily mistake socialism and distributivism. But like I said, I think you kind of answered that earlier, exactly what, what distributivism was and why, and, and how it goes against what socialism or communism uh, uh, proposes. My second question is, is in his document, Pope Leo XIII makes a strong statement. He says that, you know, it's man has a right to, to own land, that it's actually he talks about private ownership as a natural right, that it is not only lawful, but necessary. So I guess my question to you is, is, is uh, uh, spiritually, theologically, however you want to address it, why is private ownership a natural right because you know natural rights come from god himself so so he's not just saying well you have a right to do it as we use the word rights today you know well you have a right to do this you have a right to do that but 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 it's very loosely used but when he invokes it's a natural right that is very strong implications mm -hmm. so there, there's actually there's probably like a canon law question <laughs> you know, an answer to this question. So, so, you know, from, 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 and you're not going to get that from me. You know, I, I, I grew turnips and I saw God. Um, <laughs> I can give you that perspective, but, um, but, uh, but, um, Jason and I actually excommunicate people on our show all the time. So you can feel, you can feel free to be a, a, a doctor of canon law here if you want to be. No neither, neither one of us are actually allowed to be on our own podcast via the other person. <laughs> Fair enough. That's a good We're, Jason and I are technically in schism, so <laughs> yeah. And, and 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 I know that's a like you said. I know that's a very you know could be a very nuanced question. I just didn't know if you know maybe either one of you could speak to the importance of it of uh, of of why that would be a natural right versus just oh I I should be able to own land, right. Um, um, I think it comes back to the, you know, the nat natural rights for, for me, unless Fred, you want to answer, do you want to answer Fred? No, it's all yours, Mike. Okay. Um, the, uh, 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 first, first one, the first part of the question, which you said I answered already, which was what's the difference between capitalism? And well, German? yeah, no, I, I, I feel like people, because I could see myself do, doing it as well if I wasn't careful, confusing just on right. the surface what socialism I, and versus distributism is. Can I give you a bit of rhetoric that's going to clear it up forever? Yeah, so absolutely. It won't, won't, won't be made. Guys, we're having, some, we're, got, we're having some internet issues. Sorry. <laughs> Are we well, good? It yeah, I'm good. Me. I'm sorry, guys. I'm good, yeah. Uh, um, okay, yeah. Can you, okay, here we are. I think. Capitalism is 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 an economic system which believes and operates it with the idea that the free flow of capital will create the most social good. That the invisible hand of the market will, you know, in the Adam Smith way, right, will 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 uh, order things in a way that innovation and and technology and all these things will like increase and and increase the uh the, the will lift up the body of mankind that's so the free we shouldn't infringe upon capital because the hunger of markets will determine what people need and resources will get to where they want to so the the, the lack of impediment of the flow of of capital is where it is but the reality i think that we all know at this point in time is that if you do that uh capital tends to consolidate into certain places and monopolies need to be broken. So you get this agency of government necessary in capitalist uh, uh, systems. So that's capitalism. 
socialism is a reaction to the capitalist industrialism and liberalism says 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 that socialism says that private property is the root of all evils and that by the abolition of private property uh we can serve the interests of the many right so we can determine like a base from which everyone can be provided for and that that, that if we don't have private property and if we abolish which is really the core of communism is the abolition of private property it's really the core of it um the destruction of the, uh, this is going to follow. I'm going to actually bleed this one into that, <laughs> the second question of, 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 of the other thing. So, so the abolition of property is going to give us, we see what happened when the Soviets did this, they murdered each other, they starved. Um, it was horrific. It was terrible. They, they kind of severed their connection to all tradition and history and natural order. And it was an absolute disaster for that country that it is still reeling from. And really that error, as Our Lady of Fatima said, that error spread across the world and is affecting all other places now, too, including our own government. Oh, yeah. Um, so so distributism and, and, and so is the antithesis of of communism. It's not the destruction of private property. It says everybody should have a piece of private property. Every, you know, the, the truly realized distributist goal would be lots of little villages where everyone owned their own little homestead and they all had close proximity to first things. That's distributed. So it's actually distributists are saying that private property is the answer. It's the antithesis of communism. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just uh, hopefully that bit of rhetoric like cures it in your mind that you never cross it to again. Where yeah. people, I think, sometimes get confused is that like, so what agency distributes property because of the word, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, right. and it's not, that's not what we're talking about. Belloc clearly talks about the through, through the restoration of the rights of property um, through hereditary ownerships, through hereditary powers, through, you know, really they're, they're talking about reordering society to natural to natural order. Um, and that through that, the right to property emerges because dominion is part of the naturally ordered uh, 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 human experience, right? That's what was given to us by God is where we sit in the hierarchy, a hierarchy. We own and tend things unlike any other creature on this, on this, in this world. And we have a right to that. That's ordained by God. And so that's that, that, so uh, you see, I just bled into the second question, right. which is, which is where does our right to property come from? And so if you look at natural order, right, it's the same way that I have a right and responsibility as a father. You know, it's like my kids are I, I have a, they're my responsibility and I have a right to command over them. That's just naturally ordered for my existence of being a father. The same goes for the land that I that I own. Right. It's I have that 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 right of ownership kind of flows through me like a grace would flow through me through my position in the natural hierarchy <laughs> order of things um and so through that delineates a type of law right so that would be my answer i don't know if it's in line with like what a catholic scholar or a canon lawyer would say or you know how someone else might interpret uh leo's uh, pope leo's uh, the 13th uh, understanding there but that's how i would understand it is that right to property and dominion are essentially tied to our hierarchy as in our human experience in our place where we are <laughs> what makes us human um yeah. And well, no, no, no. Your your answer is good because, like I said, our our show is a lot focused on lay Catholic people. Because if people want to get that canon lawyer, very <laughs> very straightforward answer, there's a lot of other shows for that. You know, so I appreciate your you know your perspective on that because <laughs> there, there you go. You, you know what I'm saying? Because because we're not theologians. I don't have a theology degree. I'm a convert who just fell in love with the faith, and this podcast is grown my faith tremendously just in the preparation for shows and all that so like i said we're not when you know we ask you guys these questions we're not looking for you know a canon lawyer type answer or, or theologian necessarily though you sound like you could easily be a theologian <laughs> but uh but uh no no I, I appreciate that answer i thought it was it, it was very well stated and i've i've also thought about the the, the like the difference between so you know, because there is a critique of capitalism in uh, uh, there's a rejection of socialism in in uh, both Quadragissima Anno and in the Rerum Novarum, and there's a critique of some as, some elements of capitalism, and I've always like the way I would distill it is it really comes down to how we define property, 
in the, in the capitalist sense, property is sovereignty. If I buy that hamburger, that hamburger is 100% my total. If I want to throw it in the garbage, I have the right to do that. The Catholic church would say, mm, you have the right to eat that hamburger, but if you're not going to eat it and there's a somebody who's hungry sitting next to you, you have a moral obligation to share the hamburger. You can't, if you throw that hamburger away, you don't have a right to do that. That mm. so, so it's a sense of how we look at property. Um, you know, your land, uh, like, like you, you very adequately stated with uh, your children, you have dominion over your children, but they are God's property. You can't just do any darn thing with your kids. You want to. Uh, and so you have a responsibility to. My ensure... <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Do any darn thing I that's, tell you. <laughs> that's right. 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 <laughs> well, like you know, you 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 do not have the right to uh, be abusive or to, uh, you know, to to not take to to raise your children in any religion that you like. I mean, you have responsibilities that God's going to hold you to. Or to let them pick what they want. Like, right. Like let them try to advocate they... today. Yeah. Right. right. And right. so, and so that's the way I've always looked at it is it's really a, it's a, it's a, it's a nuanced discussion of that word property and how an authentic Catholic way of looking at it is the universal destination of goods means <laughs> that the property that, and, and that you have, you are responsible for, meaning you're going to be called to account for it one day at yeah. the end of time. Yeah. And, and so that's important. I always, we're coming up on an hour. So I know, uh, I know you guys have got other things to do, but real quick, I want to wrap up with a question that I always like to wrap up my, my shows with is let's talk about the role our lady plays and devotion to our lady in this, in this movement back to the land. And if that's something that you've thought about before, feel free to jump in. If it's something you've thought, Hmm, I've never really considered that before. Um, I'd be interested in hearing about that too, but I, that's just always something I, I think our lady plays such an important role in every apostolate you can think of in the Catholic church. And so I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what devotion to our blessed mother has, what role that has played in, in y'all's apostolate. Well, we all say the rosary daily. I mean, that's, that's a given. Uh, we just had a, after Stalin high mass, they, we had a, rosary um walk around the shrine it was it was beautiful mm. and i was and oh. so she plays a huge part she is not only jesus mother she is our mother um we go to her for all our needs you know? and that's important the earth is not our mother that's correct <laughs> that's correct <laughs> that's important to that's uh, correct. our lady is our mother the that's earth correct. is our Absolutely. yeah so that's yeah. so yeah we and that was, of course got our oh, fans all the uh, eco warriors out there, and the entire all of society. I mean, I'm sitting here and listening to all all Mike's rights and these rights, and society today wants to take all those rights away. You know, yeah. the government wants to take your kids over. They don't yeah. want you to have any rights over them. Um, okay, I don't. I don't want to keep going. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> You, you're free to 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 say I I I look at it like um, our our blessed lady reminds us who our mother really is, and the 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 thing about well we we want to live in harmony with our mother Earth and it's like you don't know where you are in the hierarchy of creation yet you you have not quite support and our lady with her with her earthly life of humility sim, perfect humility perfect simplicity and. Of course, in first century Palestine, maybe everybody was part of a land movement, right? <laughs> but um, that that humility and simplicity of a simple life, I think I, I look to our Blessed Mother and I think, yeah, that's the answer. That's well, she's the, answer. the ideal. I mean, what did yeah. she do in Nazareth? She raised a child. She prepared food. She cleaned a house. All mundane, boring things. But she was the mother of God. I mean, you know, Joseph... Well Joseph was a carpenter. He worked, you know, with his hands. So did Jesus. You know, that's what the land movement is. It's just those, like you said, the, the beauty of simplicity. And she's the perfect role model for that. I mean, mm. you know, there's no gospel of Mary. There's no uh, accounts of her performing miracles, you know, in, in, in the gospel or in preaching and things. But just the life that she led and, and how she raised her son. That's, that's all we need to know. And she was there. 
all the way, all the way. She was there at the foot of the cross, too. She was there when he, he rose from the dead, when he ascended. There's no other better role model for all of us. And the perfect especially women today, especially yeah. women today. Big time. And the perfect for a role model, it's Mary. It's got to be Mary. It's not oh, yeah. this one or that one on, you know, the princess of whatever or, you know, the singer of this. It's Mary, you know, the perfect role model. And yeah, and her speak. perfect fiat as well as yeah. always, and 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 it and it goes to the farming issue of you know it's like in the book of Job the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away blessed be the name of the Lord mm -hmm. when you're when you're a farmer you know hey man some sometimes the, you'll deliver a colt and watch it die and wipe your tears and say maybe next time you know so some and that's just the way it is, you realize you ain't in control over everything. That's you right. are, you that's are not the deity here. That's right. That, 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 that's the story that I was going to tell, which wasn't like a, a grander, you know, theological tie in with Mary, but, but how, you know, Mary is the mediatrix of all graces, right? She led me back. You know, my mother took me back when I was like wandering and, 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 and not really understanding who I was as a Catholic. What emerged in me was my grandmother's prayers, which was, which was a call to Mary, right? Mm -hmm. So like my first step back towards Catholicism was through Mary. And, um, and j just that exact experience, my daughter fell in love with a couple lambs this year. And we had a problem with lambs this year. I couldn't quite figure out what it was, but we lost three. You know, and I don't have a big flock. I only have like 15 ewes, you know, and so three lambs is like a big, I might even be more than three, actually, if I think about it. And one of the joy, one of her favorite lambs died quite suddenly. We didn't know why, you know, and he asked, you know, she was like, why do things like this happen? You know, why? Why does that happen, Dad? Why does God do that? You know, and I say to her, you know, we don't got to understand everything. You know, to think about what Mary did, you know, she didn't, she didn't understand everything. She just said, OK, God, you, here I am. So give the things that you don't understand. Give it. Give them to Mary. You know, she, she, she can she can show you how to carry them, you know. And so it's not like um, I don't have like a big th theological tie in, but I have a very personal relationship with Our Lady that like she's a pillar in our household. And when when we need to give something over to someone where we don't understand it, you know, it's like, give it to Mary. Um, Absolutely. Make, make, she can do that. And then that, that comes out in the family rosary and in the, you know, in the meditations of the family rosary and the meditations of the mysteries, you know, Mary, Mary, what Fred was saying, Mary's witness, you know, and her as a role model. It's like, um, yeah, but Mary's like a present figure. I think somebody else that we did a podcast with, Fred, he said that and it's echoed with me like endlessly. I think it was the trad cat night guy, maybe. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. He said um, the, the two pillars of the Catholic household are the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Here, here. Those are the pillars, and that's what the roof of the Catholic family mm. sits on. You know, mm. that stayed, that's really stayed with me um, uh, since he said that, and I think it's really, really true. And so, mm. to what Fred's saying, like rosary, giving up what I can't carry was too heavy for me. Giving it up to Mary and knowing that she's there for me, and uh, and you know, leaning into humility. You know, so that's uh, that's how Mary plays a role in my life, mm. bigger than the Catholic Lamb movement. You know. <laughs> And I think Mary likes, I think Mary loves that more. I mean, Mary loves her theologians too. Don't get me wrong. But um, I think, I think our, something about our lady, just, she just appreciates that simple, humble devotion and love like a son has for a mother more, more so than, um, you know, a, a grand sort of theological treatise necessarily. And, and so I, yeah, well, no, I, who, who, did, who did Mary appear to? She appeared to children. Children, no, you're right. Shepherd, shepherd, yeah. shepherd kids, yeah. not yeah. The theologians, you know. Right. It's like, yep. Well said, Mark. Mark, before we go, because mm -hmm. because I know, like like you mentioned, we're coming up on time here. I, I did want to uh, to just uh, ask a question. Let them speak on uh, their their conference as well. So I think the two questions will tie yes. together. Yes, I think that I think the two questions will uh, will, will go together, but. Um, or I should say one question, but um, I had spoken to both Mike and Fred offline about, you know, the practical uh, aspects of this, like, okay, well, if somebody like myself or you or whoever wants to go back to the land, 
it's, you, you, you know, you can't just necessarily, I can't just go into the office tomorrow, say I quit my job and move, right? Because you, you have a family and all that that is dependent on you to provide for them, right? You know, I got, I got seven mouths to feed. So, so I'd ask them, what, what's your, uh, what's your advice? And I thought they both gave really good advice. So if you could speak to the practical aspects of somebody that says, okay, I want to do this, but how do I do that and provide for my family at the same time? And then, and then of course, I, I think that will kind of lead into your, maybe your, your conference as well, what, what that entails and, and what your plans are with that. Well, I mean, I'm fortunate that I'm uh, I'm retired, so I don't have those issues. Uh, one of the reasons, I mean, I have thought about this lifestyle for quite a while, but exact that's what exactly held me back because I had kids. Uh, do I take them out of the city? I mean, I I had a friend that wanted me to go up to the towards the Canadian border. Uh, you know, he was going to give me property and things, and I said no, no because I thought it'd be better for the kids to be in the city. So, yeah, it's, it's a tough decision. And Mike homeschools, his wife homeschools, and if I had to do it over again, yeah, I, I would homeschool. My, my wife was a, was a teacher all her career, and she could certainly teach them. And we know lots lots of other families that homeschool. Um, I don't know where I was going with this <laughs> Uh, my 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 answer, Jason, uh, so would be twofold. Um, back in the beginning, I think the first time I answered the question, I talked about the the twofold nature of property and tradition being the components of the Catholic land movement. That we it's a restoration of property and it's a restoration of tradition. Well, you don't need necessarily the property to begin to restore the traditions. So if you feel this calling in you, if you're like, oh. I really feel called to, you know, take my family out, you know, in, in some type of like the, the, the calling of like St. Benedict or, you know, like there's no more good I can do here. It's time for us to flee, you know, or, you know, you're feeling like it's Sodom and Gomorrah and you're like, I got to get out. You know, the, the, the prudent thing to do um, as a father or as somebody who has a, is to begin to amass uh, those skills that you would need and re, re, be begin to restore your ties to the traditions that could produce primary things. And so learning how to hunt, learning how to grow, you know, vegetables uh, in your backyard if you have a little plot, you know, learning how to do a timber frame joint so you can build a sheep, you know, a hut, learning how to tie, you know, f you know fishing lures, learning how to... Um, you know, butcher an animal by hunting or something else, you know, learn, re re restoring, you don't need like a big amount of property to begin to restore and reclaim those skills. And that can happen in tandem while you provide for the needs of your, or your family. And then I would really suggest that people, um, uh, you know, find ways to come into practical connection with like, you know, a rural communities, whether it's attending a rural TLM or it's it's going out and like um, maybe volunteering in a farm or, or something else and begin to establish those practical or a greenhouse or an orchard or, you know, uh, going and volunteering somewhere, or offering to work, seasonal work, maybe harvest work, even if it's like, OK, I can't I'm not going to. um you know, I'm not going to like transition my whole career to like being an apple picker, but perhaps there's like a small orchard that I could pick apples for and show up at like, you know, six o'clock in the morning and work till six at night and be like, this is a gift. I'm here to understand like how to witness your process in your orchard. Let me just pick apples with you all day, you know, and there's going to be farmers who are going to be like, thank you. That sounds great, you know? <laughs> and so, and so I would like encourage people to do that, spend a Saturday doing that. And you'll, you would see that from there, like your connections would grow. And then before you knew it, you would drive past just the right little house and you'd be like, we can do it there, you know? Um, and then you can get yourself out, but as well, have patience, you know, with yourself and with the process, you know, my, one of the, one of my own little like, uh, aphorisms that goes over and over in my head is that like the oak like you know it grows very very slowly and it doesn't grow straight <laughs> you know <laughs> but it you does know? grow strong yes right. it's strong and the deepest tree right it's like the biggest thing on the landscape is the mighty oak but 
It's neither straight nor nor it did it happen overnight. It's the slowest growing of the, all the trees, and it takes lots of different paths to get to where it's going. So have mm. patience with yourself, you know, and have patience with like the the time it might take. And then back to the humility thing, you know, maybe um maybe it's not your calling, you know, maybe, maybe you're to have a whole little homestead all to yourself. Like, isn't, isn't, you know what, or maybe you're to go to someone else's place and help them and like join their effort, you know? Um, so, so yeah, that would be my advice to, to people for young men. Just like, I would really just be like, pick up a trade and move out rural work with some yeah. construction company or landscaping company or something. There's a million people tree service. There's a, if you show up at seven o'clock in the morning and work till, you know, four, five every day and you do it with a happy smile and you're strong and you can just work you got a place out there there's the, you know there's so few people know how to do that anymore yeah. I've, I've, I've i've definitely been playing on and with my older boys you know pushing the trades because the trades are definitely needed and definitely something that are for some reason looked down by many people oh, yeah, in, yeah. in this country but anyway yeah but the but the trades are definitely a way to go and, yep. and when you talked about, you know, showing up and volunteering, I've never met the farmer who, Hey, do you need any help? And they're like, no, I'm good. I've never met that farmer. <laughs> that farmer does not exist. You just get <laughs> out of here. Yeah. They'll be <laughs> small. You'll be, you'll be shucking poop, but, they, but, but, but it'll bring you in proximity to a rural landscape. You know, it'll yeah. bring you, it's, it's totally there for the, but you gotta be, you gotta put yourself out there. You gotta knock on doors. You got, you know, you gotta make it happen for yourself. Yeah. But also the and, restoration of skills, you know, you can, you can do that. You could, in your little apartment, you could have two blocks of wood and teach yourself mortise and tenon joints. Mm, that's you, a good you, point. You, I've actually, I've actually taught myself how to do that specific joint in my garage myself, <laughs> you know, just YouTube videos and out in my garage on some woodworking projects. Yep. There you go. And, and what's the conference that you guys have coming up? Let's talk a little bit about that. I'm, I'm going to, is there a website or anything like that? Okay, I'm going to put a link to that in the description of this show. Tell us a little bit about the conference. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, the conference <laughs> is the idea of bringing Catholics together under the banner of the Catholic land movement, um, and not so much to be like experts or or um, or uh, you know like this is the way to do it, but more to bring people together in fellowship and discussion to talk about these ideas, to talk about what homesteading is, to basically do what we're doing again. So to bring people together, it's got three major focuses, which is like moderated discussion groups, then skill stations where like people can work with each other instead of having like a thing, you know, you go to these workshops and you learn how to like seed a mushroom log and you forget everything about it the second you leave, you know? So sure. we really want to focus on the fellowship between people and getting people just to work simply next to each other so they can build relationship and fellowship in Christ around getting back to the landscape, you know? And so hoping more connections grow from this. So it's a three day conference. It's going to be hosted on my farm here. Um, discussion groups, uh, uh, a bunch of different workstations, and then a little like kind of chapel building that we built, um, where there'll be prayers. Uh, our, our Father Slezak, uh, uh, the, the priest at our parish, is going to offer prayers th for the day um, uh, with some other people, some holy orders people. There's some, you know, there's all, all the but chanting. There's a whole bunch of different things. But the idea is like a three-day conference where we can really build fellowship around this idea of our, the reemergence of the Catholic land movement. And then hopefully from there, it grows into who knows what. From, from there. But, you know, the spirit kind of, we leave enough room for the spirit in the event that it carries itself. So it's, it's um, you know, uh, that's what it is. It's a three-day conference on my farm, camping, bonfire, food, um, fellowship, work. With oh, the sounds, sounds, did, sounds, sounds, sounds boring. <laughs> did I, <laughs> just kidding, man. I'd, I'd love I, to go to something like that. Did yeah. I read correctly that it sold out? Yes. Yeah, well, oh. well te technically not sold out because it's free. Oh, <laughs> well, it's filled up. <laughs> it's filled yeah. up. There you okay. go. The response to it has been tremendous. There's two, there's, there's, at the closing of like, we can't take anymore, much because I feel like my wife and other, other people who are helping me plan this um we're like we can't take any more people like <laughs> there's 250 people signed up to, to wow and then how like, quick did that happen how quick did it fill it up from the time you you put it out was it fairly quickly like a month and we About got a month yeah oh my like, god we got two wow. months to go till it happens so it's like it's huge there's like i said this this catholic land thing this this idea of getting back to the land as a catholic um 
it, you know, we didn't even get to like, uh, we didn't talk about Father Fay and, you know, the end of liberalism and, and the really reactionary element that this is. But this is like emerging powerfully as the global technocracy consolidates power. People are having a reaction to that. And it's like sure. visceral in their bones. They're like, I got to like take care of my family. I got to, you know, as fathers, we like feel this. Right. And so. <laughs> And so this like was really emerging in people. And I think that this was like a, a very practical way where people are like, oh, I can plug into something. Here's this thing I can plug into. Oh, yeah. I mean, it really touched a nerve. I mean, it's it's right. happening nationwide or yeah. even international, you know. Well, uh, I think that I think the great resignation, as they call it, is playing is, is also playing into this as well. Yep, 100 percent. So, so yeah, I hope that this is maybe one of like many conferences that happens or that maybe like a national organization kind of forms or something where we try and carry that mission of the restoration of property and the restoration of skills and the centering and glorification of God is like the Catholic land movement. We carry that into like little hubs all over the place. I have tons of ideas. I could, I could talk every, yeah, I could talk blue. Um, <laughs> Well, well, I hope you'll you'll come back on the show and and let us know as things progress, and we'll we'll get to talk to you all again because this was a fascinating discussion. Yeah, it was everything I, I hoped it would be, and and uh, I think people are going to get a lot out of this. Yeah, no, we, we appreciate you both uh, coming on. Like like Mark said, it's a fascinating discussion. I I if I was seem scatterbrained, it's because I was because I have so many questions on this topic. You know, you, you're just trying to figure out which one yeah. you want to you want to ask but uh yeah we'd definitely love to have you guys back on well, in the, it's, in the it's been an honor the, thank you so much further. yeah thank you guys and let's and let's say a quick agimos tibi gracias omnipotence deus for universis beneficis tuis qui vivis et regnas in secula seculorum amen in nomine patris et fili et spiritus sancti amen because that's who we really ought to give our thanks to amen um this was a fantastic discussion thank mike you. and fred i want to thank you guys so much for coming <laughs> and out and there we go and, and the, my internet's dipping in and out so i think god's telling me to wrap it up it. <laughs> god bless you everyone you. and remember and remember life is hard but it's harder when you don't pray the rosary there god you bless go. everybody god bless thank you